Dear brothers and sisters, it's very nice to be with you today at the official launch of Al Nasiha Foundation. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us all with this through these meetings uh, and also to make Al Nasiha Foundation one of those foundations who help to spread beneficial knowledge among the Muslims. Today my talk is, before I start the talk, I would like to, um, as I normally do, to remind us, because we all know, alhamdulillah, these things, that when we come, here, when we come together to study the religion of Allah and to study the religion of Islam, there are certain etiquettes that we must observe. These etiquettes are practiced and preached everywhere, including universities, colleges, throughout the world, and schools as well. So we get acquainted with these very early as children. One of those principles is to be always on time. And I know that, like Sheikh Abu Sama has mentioned, some of us, or most of us, run on Muslim Standard Time, MST. That is something we laugh about, but it's something that is not acceptable. If we want to be serious about our efforts to show other people that the way of Islam is the right way, we have to show them that the time of Islam, the timing of Muslims, is the right timing. It is not a normal situation when we have each other asking, we ask one another, do you mean Muslim time? It's not a normal situation, brothers and sisters. So when we come to gatherings like these, and of course for the brothers who arrange, it's very difficult, so you have to cooperate with them. All of us will have to cooperate with them and uh, if, for example, the talk starts at 2.30, we should be, as people who listen, 2.25, we should be inside. Because at university, we used to have a rule. Our lecturers used to say, be after me, no one comes in. I mean, some of you may say this is too harsh. But it's not harsh. This is something to do to make sure that nothing is disrupted. So the first one is to be on time. Some of you may think it's harsh. I personally don't think so. I think it's very normal. And we do so in other environments. The other one is when we come together for a gathering of knowledge, and this is something we learn from the ulama, I'm not taking it from the top of my head. Another thing that we have to bear in mind is that we don't eat and drink when we are seeking ilm, because we are seeking ilm. You are not allowed to eat and drink at university, at college, at school, while the session is going on. And we, of course, are going to talk about something much more important. We get breaks to eat and drink, you should be able to be within that. Another thing, alhamdulillah, we have chairs. When it happens in a mosque, we have brothers sleeping in front of the speaker. Sleeping. Or lying as if he's on the beach. I know it's funny, but it's very disrespectful. And we shouldn't be accepting that. It's not correct. If he wants to lie, that's fine. He can lie any other time. Now is the time for the lecture. So that's very important for us to know these things so that we get the most benefit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even revealed ayat to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to teach them about how to treat the Prophet sallam in these circumstances and conditions. So it's very, very important for us to do that. There are many other things that we can say, but we don't have time. We only have 45 out of them. I've been now speaking for something like five minutes. So I've only have 40 minutes left. So. Today, inshallah, we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the names and attributes of Allah. 
The very first pillar, as all of you know, the very first pillar of Islam and the very first pillar of Iman is to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the Most High, the one who has infinite mercy. And when we say La ilaha illallah, we testify that no one deserves the worship except Allah. When we say that the first pillar of Iman, of our faith, is to believe in Allah, we sometimes don't realize what it entails. The ulama said that the very first obligation upon a Muslim is to know his Lord. And they included it in their texts of Aqeedah. Like Abu Ishaq al-Safarini rahimahullah said, أول واجب على العبيد معرفة الرب بالتسديد The first wajib, the first obligation is to know Allah. Where he is, who he is. And we can only do that by studying the texts of the Quran and the Sunnah. Because we, don't know, we do not see Allah, we do not hear Allah, unless he sends messengers to us and they tell us who Allah is. And they show us through their speech and in their books that they bring from Allah who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. That is why it's very important for us to understand that to learn to pay attention to the first pillar of Islam takes precedence over any other in our priorities. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it obligatory upon every single individual. For example, zakah is only obligatory for those people who qualify. So not all of us would be obliged to pay zakah. And zakah, for those of you who may not know the Arabic word, means that tax that is levied on people whose wealth surpasses a certain level. You can say it's a poverty tax, which, which is extremely minuscule. It's only in cash, it's 2.5% two, two of what you own. Uh, Hajj, pilgrimage to the house of Allah, is not obligatory upon every single individual. Only for those people who can do it. So some Muslims may live their whole lives and never have made Hajj. Some people may live their whole lives never paid zakah. Are they sinful? No. If they were not obliged to do it. But people who don't know Allah, that includes us as Muslims, when we become Muslims, when we start practicing our religion, if we are born Muslims, we are accountable in front of Allah if we did enough to know Him. Because we say no one deserves our worship except Him. Who is He? Where is He? What is He described with? You know, because some people may say Allah is a, uh, something. And we say, yeah, that's true. Makes sense. And Allah doesn't accept that description. So that is why what we call, and the word Tawheed is found in two ahadith, at least I can remember, despite what some people say, that Tawheed is the invention of the Wahhabis, they say. Because they, when we say Tawheed, Tawheed, the very impo important thing, Tawheed, they say all you say is Tawheed, nothing else. And that's not true, but what we're saying is, and we're not Wahhabis, alhamdulillah, I personally don't accept that sticker. Because there are people who have a collection of stickers. There's a sticker for you, there's a sticker for someone else. So when they hear something, they say, okay, this guy is a Wahhabi, let's stick him with that. If they hear something else, they put another sticker. Okay, so I don't accept that sticker myself, and I don't advise you to do so. But the word Tawheed is found in two ahadith. The first one, when uh, the Prophet ﷺ sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen to teach and to call people to Tawheed, and he said in one of the narrations of that hadith, call them to an Yuwahidullah. Yuwahidullah in Arabic means that they worship Allah and they do Tawheed. The other hadith is the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari radiallahu anhumah. 
in Sahih Muslim in which the Prophet والسلام, the Prophet's Hajj was described and in it it says when he assumed Ihram he assumed Ihram with Tawheed with monotheism because the pre-Islamic Arabs used to say shirk in their Ihram they used to assume Ihram or they used to want to do Hajj and they used to say لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكْ إِلَّا شَرِيكًا هُوَ لَكْ They used to say, Oh Allah, we assume we answer your call. You have no partner except one partner whom you own anyway. So the Prophet omitted that part and he said, You have no partner. And he, Jabir, described it, أَهَلَّ بِالتَّوْحِيد He assumed ihram with tawheed. Tawheed is the first obligation upon us. In the Ten Commandments, if you look, the first obligation is Tawheed. To worship God alone, without any partners. And that, that is in our religion the same. So the ulama looked at what the Quran says and looked at what Prophet Muhammad والسلام, said. And they said, we find Tawheed to be of certain aspects, and they mentioned three aspects. Some ayat, some verses, and some ahadith, they talk about the lordship of Allah, the fact that He is the Lord of everything, that He created everything, that He is the giver of life, and the one who takes the souls alone. The one who gives rizq, provision, to every single living being, small and large. And they said this we can call Tawheed al rububiyyah Because it's to do with the Rabb, Rububiyyah of Allah, the Lordship, all the meanings of being a Lord. And that is something that generally all people of the earth agree to. Most people of the earth Muslims, non-Muslims, they agree to that. Some call it a sup supreme being, some call it God, some call it something else. They say that that supreme being, God, whatever they call, we call him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he controls everything. He's the giver of life and death. He's the provider. Then they looked again at the verses and the hadith, the traditions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and they found that there are certain names that Allah described himself with and certain descriptions other than his names. For example, he said about himself that he is the most merciful, the giver of mercy. He described himself as the all-hearing, all-knowing, all-wise. So they said, this, these we can group so that it's easy for people to understand and for us as well. We can call it Tawheed al asmai wa Sifat. The Tawheed of the names and attributes of Allah. And then they looked finally and they said that the Quran and the Sunnah in relation to Allah whom we worship tells us to worship Him alone in everything that is considered to be an act of worship. And they said this we can call Tawheed al ibadah the Tawheed of worship or Tawheed of Uluhiyyah which is the same thing. And this last one is the first one. In the sense that it's the first obligation for us to worship Allah and not to direct anyone. Our prayer, we can't direct to anyone but Him. Our supplications, dua, we can make dua like some people do. And some ulama, some scholars of Islam, they said the first two, they talk about Allah. So we can group them into one and say this is Tawheed of Ma'rifah and Ithbat. This is Tawheed of knowing Allah. And with the last, due to its importance, we leave it alone because it's to do with the worship of Allah. That it's to do with us, what we do and say and believe. So there is no fourth. Some people say there's Tawheed to do with our rulers. We might say there's Tawheed to do with our butchers as well. 
Very important. We're talking about halal meat. No? Some people say if it's not our stamp, it's not halal. Some people say that. So it's important. We all meet meat eaters, carnivores. But we don't make that the butcher, if he doesn't do as Allah said, then we have to make special tawheed for him. Because it's included in the tawheed of Rububiyyah. In the tawheed that Allah is the Lord and he must judge by what Allah revealed. There are three. Because some people say there are three, four, five. There's no problem if you have six even. It's not correct. Because this is the most important issue in the religion of Islam. Today we're going to talk about very briefly about the second part of it which is to do with the names and attributes of Allah. Regarding like I said Rububiya, the fact that Allah is the sole creator, provider, the sole, the only one who gives life and death, the only one who controls everything, there is very little difference between the people. You hardly find a Muslim who differs with you on that. Because if he does, he's a kafir. He's not a Muslim. Regarding the fact that we must worship Allah alone, there is very little difference in theory as well. So if you say to a Muslim, brother or sister, who do you think we must worship? Or who do you think we, we must obey and not direct any act of worship except to him, they will say Allah. So in theory, in practice, they may differ. In practice, they may do something which is an act of worship and they may direct it to others than Allah. But in theory, they don't differ. What we have in terms of the names of Allah and his descriptions, which we call attributes, is the fact that a lot of people differ on that issue. And that is why it's very important for us to understand the issue of the names and attributes. Someone who tells you that the belief of a, of a Muslim is difficult, don't believe them. The creed and belief of Muslims is very easy indeed. And that I can illustrate very quickly. Number one, the fact that it's obligatory upon every single person, whether they're educated or not educated, whether they're academics and professors or they're just simple workers. And of course nowadays, I want to mention this point, people look down upon people who work with their hands. People look down upon them. And some languages, they have as a swear word, the word shepherd. And the Prophet ﷺ said, all prophets were shepherds. So we have to be careful when we say, you shepherd. It's not in English. In English we don't say, you shepherd. But in some languages, like in Russian, when they see a Muslim wearing a hat, they say, this guy is a shepherd. Hat, not this hat. The Russian hat, big one. So we used to wear it just to make a few people angry because when you're young, you know, you need to make someone angry. You just, life is not the same without it. If everyone is happy with you, like feel bad, you know. So, I mean, it's wrong, something is... So we used to go in the corridors of the uni when we were like 19, 20. And the culture in Russia is to remove your headgear when you're inside. So like all, all of us guys, we have to remove it. If we're in Russia now, we can't all sit like this. That tells you different cultures, yeah? So we used to have in the winter that massive Russian hat and walk three or four of us in the uni. So some teachers would like look at us like this and say nothing because they're... Still something left in yani, some of the education they received. But some they would say, these guys are shepherds. So the word shepherd, if you have a language that uses it as a, as a swear word, is not correct for us to do that because the best people of mankind were shepherds according to the Prophet ﷺ. And they said, even you, he said, even me. So to have a manual job is nothing wrong with it. We need good mechanics. I can't, I can't find a mechanic I can trust, believe me, for my car. And unfortunately, if it's a Muslim, I say, no, no, thank you very much. 
That's very sad for me to say, but it's true. I can't find a plumber I can trust. I can't find an electrician I can trust. I'm sure some of you can relate to that. I hope if you're plumbers, electricians, mechanics, don't be offended. But Allah SWT made this aqidah obligatory upon all of us, whether we are mechanics, whether we are shepherds, whether we are professors, every single individual must know Allah, must know what is permissible for them to believe and say and do and what is not. The second point which proves that it is easy, the aqidah, the belief of a Muslim, look at books of aqidah, brothers and sisters. Just take any book, I mean, outside we have even the books of fiqh and compare it to books of fiqh. Fiqh is to do with our acts of worship mostly, with things we do, with our transactions, acts of worship. Tell me one book of fiqh that's been, that's been translated into English. Do you know any? Because Bulugh al-Maram is a collection of hadith. Sahih al-Bukhari is a collection of hadith. Sahih al-Muslim is a collection of hadith. All of those are a collection. But one book where they bring the sayings of the ulama. Because it's not enough for us to know hadith. We have to know what it means. There are other hadith that maybe have cancelled this hadith. We have to know all that. Which book, to my knowledge, no book has been translated into English. I'm sure into Urdu maybe. Because Urdu, I was shocked how many books are translated into Urdu. I think after Arabic is Urdu. Even I started learning Urdu. Because some people, <laughs> some people when I started learning Arabic, they said, Brother, what's wrong with you? Why are you learning Arabic? Learn Urdu. I said, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Why should I learn Urdu, brother? He said, it's the second most widespread language amongst the Muslims. I said, second? What's the first? He said, Arabic. <laughs> so I said, why should I leave the first and learn the second then? So now I'm realizing that guy was right. After Arabic, you can learn Urdu. So I'm starting. I bought a book, Imran knows. Urdu in two months. Even though I don't believe the title. Don't believe titles of books you buy, okay? Many of these are just to sell the book. Because I teach Arabic, I know that one brother brought me a book in Kenya they sold. Arabic in a week. I said, mashallah. I'm sure that this book sold like the hot cakes, whatever they call it. He said, yes, there was none left. I said, that's true. Because everyone believed the title. So the, the point I'm making is that aqidah is obligatory. And aqidah is much easier than fiqh, for example. And that is something we have to know, but it doesn't mean that it's something we can disregard. So in relation to the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes, the ulama, they put certain things. First of all, they said, we believe in them as Allah said. So if Allah said he's all hearing, we say he can hear anything, anywhere. He's all seeing, he can see anything, anywhere. He's all knowing, he knows everything. And that is the belief of a Muslim. So we must believe in that as they are haqiqatan. And that means that the meanings of those words, we don't change. We don't change. If Allah describes himself as having a face, we don't say, if you say Allah has a face, it's like our faces. We have a face. We have faces. Some of us even more than one. Naam? <laughs> Some have even two faces. Some three, four. Some five. We can't say that. And Ibn Taymiyyah, I will give you from all this talk, if you only remember this, what I'm going to say now, that's great for me. Because the people who say, if you say Allah has body parts, things, or oh, Allah doesn't have body parts. Allah has... Things that with us are body parts. Like hands, he said foot, he said leg, he said shin, describing himself. He said eyes. So many, many Muslims said, we can't describe our Lord like that. With things we have, 
So the, the correct belief is that we do describe him, but what do we say? We don't say how they are. So we don't say, how is the face of Allah? Because he didn't tell us. Okay? Number two, we don't compare it to anything. Because he said, Laysa kamitlihi shay. There is nothing like him. And he said, Ulam yakullahu kufwan ahad. And there is no equivalent to him. Hal ta'lamu lahu samiyya? In Surah Maria. Do you know anyone who is like him or has the same names? And also we say that these are truly, the meanings are known to us. The meanings are known to us. Because some people say we don't know the meanings. Allah said face, Allahu A'lam. Some people say, mashallah, what a nice answer. It's not a nice answer, it's an answer of an ignorant person. Because face means face. Allah has a face. Allah has hands, Allah has eyes. Also we say we can't describe Allah except how he described himself and his Prophet Why? Because if we don't have never seen him, have never heard from him, except through the way that he sends us messengers and tells us Allah is like that, like that, how can we talk about him without knowledge? If someone said, do you know that brother in Glasgow, say, so never seen him, and then you start saying, oh yeah, yeah, the brother, you know, that... Uh, and people say, you've never seen him. How can you describe him even? Because once I went into a school in Leicester, big school, modern school, Islamic school. And there was a big screen and it said, Allah can speak without a tongue. I mean, this is the greeting when you come into a reception, this is the greeting. Allah can speak without a tongue, he can hear without ears. In English, it said. So I said, excuse me, something is wrong with your TV. They said, oh yeah, this is a number for maintenance. I said, what maintenance? You Muslims or not? Something saying about Allah which is not correct. We can't describe Allah how he didn't describe himself. Or the Prophet Sallallahu didn't describe. Did Allah mention that he, anything about a tongue? No. Did the Prophet ﷺ mention anything about a tongue or ears? No, nothing. So this is one of the rules regarding, this is adab, because many people say those brothers have no adab. Why? Because we say this something is not right. Something is bid'ah. Something is haram. Something is an innovation. In the deen, not in the... Some ulama like Imam Noah said, there's bid'ah wajiba. Some of you, wow, what's this? Bid'ah wajiba. Bid'ah wajiba. And he thought things that are not in the deen. Like washing machines, things that make our life easy. Cars. He said, we must do these things. And he counted those that are not from the deen. That's why before we talk about ulama, we have to understand what they mean. All ulama agreed that it's not permissible for us to innovate in our religion. Now, So therefore, it's not permissible for us to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to say about him what he didn't say. When we describe him, and when people say, if we say, even there are those who say, if we say he can hear, we have compared him to the creation because we can hear, we can see. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, came with a very nice principle. Three questions. He said, those, the, the, the worst of those extreme people, he believes that Allah exists. Because if someone says Allah doesn't exist, he's no longer a Muslim. We say to them, does Allah exist? He has to say what? Yes. The second question, do I exist? If he says no, say, Majnoon, inshallah, until you get better, we'll talk later. And I'm not, I don't exist and I'm talking to you. So he has to say what? Yes. Do I exist? Yes. Is my existence like the existence of Allah? If he says yes, what happens? He's a kafir. Because you can't compare Allah to his creation. Because Allah says, And the person who says Allah is like you is against those ayat and ahadith. So he has to say what? 
No. So two yeses and a no. And there is no way out of those three questions for any Muslim. And what we say then is what the ulama said, al-kalamu fi sifat kal kalami fi that. What we say about descriptions of Allah, which we call sifat, attributes of Allah, is the same what we say about his, his self, his description. Because we said he's, he exists, and we exist, our existence, we can say that about any other attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can say, does he hear? Yes. Do we hear? Yes. Is the same? No. Yes, yes, no. Yes, yes, no. All the time. Does he have a face? Yes. Do we have faces? Yes. The same? No. That's how we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how the Salaf believed. Starting with the Sahaba, anhu, the pious predecessors, tried to find something the Sahaba said about Tawheed al Asma Sifat. Try to find. What do you find? Not much, very little. Maybe Ibn Umar said later, later, very late. Ibn Abbas, who lived long. Anas, radiallahu anhu. Why? Why is it that they have big fatawa, long, long, long books? We can fill books, eight, nine volumes, with how to pray, how to do hajj, how to. And we don't find anything about who is Allah because they said what Allah described Himself is enough. What he said, we understand. Later, people started talking. Later. And later, the ulama of Islam were forced to author books. Well, like when Imam Malik, rahimahullah, and they say he took it from Ibn Abbas, that statement, when a man came to the masjid in Medina and said, Ya Abba Abdullah, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. Kayfa istawa? That Allah rose over the throne. And this is one of the contentious issues with many Muslims, they say he is not over the throne. He is everywhere. So once I talked to a brother like that, I was in a car and he was a taxi driver. Every Muslim is a taxi driver until proven otherwise. That's one of my dodgy principles. Now, so we were in, in the taxi and he said, I don't know how we got around that. He said Allah is everywhere and things like that. So I said, brother, let me ask you something. Is Allah in your car now with us? He said, Hudu Billah. No. I said, okay, that's good. Is Allah in your flat, in your house, where you live, in your residence? He said, no, no, no. Okay, so we continued until I reached the destination. <laughs> I kept giving him locations. And he kept saying no. And I said, then, brother, where is Allah? He said, I don't know. I said, good, because now is my turn to speak. Because if you were continuing saying no, 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 and then said, yes, he's everywhere, that means something is wrong. So he said, logical answer is what? I don't know, because you've confused me now. So I said, isn't it easier for us to say what Allah said? He's over the throne. And more befitting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said it's true. Alhamdulillah. And that's why you don't find, like I said, much. Well, who do you find Umar talking about istiwa? Where, where is it? Where? We don't find it. Because they know the meanings. And this man came to Imam Malik and said, How did he rise over the throne? How? How? Allah said in the Quran, in seven places, how did he rise over the throne? So Imam Malik got angry. You have to understand, in order for us to understand the emotions of those people, you have to understand the, uh, the surroundings. It's different to us. We get angry every day like this because we hear that all the time. And maybe sometimes we don't get angry. You have to understand the environment. The environment is that of ilm, where the ulama are respected. Where Imam Ahmad can have a circle with four and a half thousand students in it, which in itself is amazing, and 500 are only writing the ilm. 4,000 4, are observing Imam Ahmad. Now if you said to someone, brother or sister, you can come, but you have to observe the sheikh for a while. What is he talking about? Observe the sheikh? I have better things to do, like watching one day cricket or something. Imagine the one day cricket. 
It means whole day. I know even I found out it's 50 overs. And some of us pretend to be busy when we're watching one day cricket. Yes, brother? No, sorry, I'm busy. The third inning just started. Because that he's thinking, he's not saying that. No? Oh, I'm watching match of the day. No? So we have to, to see how we are busy with what. We're all busy. Everyone is busy. Are we busy with the right thing? That's the important thing. So therefore, Imam Malik got angry. Because the environment of ilm, environment of respect to the ulama, environment of not asking strange questions. And he got angry. And he said, al istiwa ma'loom. And this he took from Ibn Abbas. The meaning of rising over the throne is known. So don't believe those who say when Allah says Allah rose over the throne. We don't know that. So because that means Allah told us something which we don't understand. In the most important thing of the deed. He told us how to go to the toilet. How to be with our wives and children. And he didn't tell us about himself. Because he just told us something we don't even understand. That's incorrect. That's illogical. He said that istiwa ma'lum, and in some narrations, غير majhul. Same thing. Istiwa is known. Wal kaifu majhul. How what you are asking right now is not known to us. That's the reason he got angry. Because you should be sufficing yourself with what Allah said, not say how and things like that. Allah said, Alhamdulillah. سمعنا وطعنا هي ان وي بي سو ذا هاو از نوت نو الايمان به او بالاول واجب تو بيليف ان ذا استواء از اوبليجاتوري اند تو والسؤال عنه بدعه سؤال اسكينج اباوت ذا كيف از بدعه وات از بدعه ان ذيس كيس اند ذات از بدعه وات وي مين ان اول كيسز وين وي ساي بدعه مينز انوفيشن ان ذا ريليجن بيكوز نو ون بيفور يو سايد ات نو ون ذا بيبل اوف علم we don't find because we don't now, we live in strange times. Everyone talks about the deen. You know, I say this all the time, but when you have a gathering of brothers, I don't know about sisters, gathering of brothers, we say, mashallah, we have an issue of, you know, my car, something happened, that mechanic messed it up. Brother, can you just answer this question for me? He says, Akhi Allah, alam. ask this brother, he's, mechanic, he's a mechanic. MashaAllah, this very pious man. He doesn't want to talk about cars because it's not his speciality. But when we start talking about the deen, all ten brothers are talking. No one says, Allahu A'lam. We have one here who specializes. But when we start talking about doctors, about medicine, about anything, they say, this brother is a special specialist. Ikhwan, what has more priority to be referred to a specialist. A car, a broken leg, or a broken dean. There is no doubt. That's why Imam Malik Ramallah said to this man, it's bidah what you're saying, because none of the people of Ilm said it. Because you guys can say it, he means, but that's not what we follow. What we follow is what the Sahaba radiallahu anhu told us. None of them talked about it. That's why the ulama, if you look at old books, those of you who know Arabic, you can go and all look at old books that are printed now. You find Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, Imam Ada, Imam this, Imam that saying. We didn't find anyone saying this, doing this, from those ulama who came before us. They don't say, we don't find people doing it like now. What are people going to say? They look at the ulama. Because the ulama, the scholars of Islam, are those people who are the inheritors of Prophet Muhammad They spend day and night studying the deen. And the, the students of ilm are the ulama of the future. Do you think Shaykh Ibn Uthameen became a alim straight away? When he started teaching, he wasn't a alim yet. He was a student of knowledge. He started teaching. He continued for 50 years or more. The same with Sheikh Al-Albani when he started writing books. You think the same as when he wrote books later? No, they're not the same. Some people think that. That you have to accumulate students of knowledge. 
It's not correct. No one who humiliates students of knowledge will ever be successful. Because students of knowledge are the ulama of the future. But they differ in their level, just like the ulama differ. Some specialize in this, some specialize in hadith, some specialize in fiqh. Some specialize in usul, usul al-din, usul al-fiqh. They're very strong in that. But if you ask about hadith, he doesn't know much. And so on. So therefore, brothers and sisters, we have to understand that the issue of names and attributes is very important. So we don't say how, we don't negate them, we don't compare them to any of the names and attributes of human beings or any of the creation. That's very important for us to know. And we only say what Allah said about himself and what the Prophet ﷺ said about his Lord. And we refrain from anything and everything that he didn't say and his Prophet ﷺ didn't say. That's very important for us to understand. There are many, many principles that we can talk about, but these, I believe, are not suitable for us to, to discuss when we're having a lecture because they need lesson-type environments. Uh, or where we are given more time because there, is, there are very nice books about that, those issues. One of them is by Sheikh Ibn Uthameen, Al Qawaid al Muthla, Fi Sifat Allah Ta'ala wa Asma'ihi al Husna. The principles about the names and attributes of Allah. It's a small book, it's very thin. With the explanation, it's still thin. Without explanation, it's only a few pages. The Haqida Wasitiya of Sheikh Al Islam to Taymir, which he wrote after Asr. Before Maghrib, he finished it. It's a few pages, few A4s, maybe like this, few A4s. The explanation, of course, make it big because they need to be explained sometimes. But the the text itself, what we believe in, few pages, but great pages, important pages. That's why, brothers and sisters, we must understand that the issue of names and attributes is not difficult, but it is very, very important. We have to pay attention to them. I believe it's been translated, I think, the book of Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen. I don't have, I'm not really up to date with English books, but I believe it's been translated. And if you don't speak Arabic, my advice is speak Arabic. You, you guys thought maybe buy the English book or something. Yeah, okay, I mean, if you don't find time because you got cricket and everything, then you can buy the English book. But if you get some time off the cricket, because I know Pakistan won the 2020 Cup and everything, because we couldn't sleep. I'm sure you couldn't sleep. The guys were celebrating as if England won the World Cup in football. No? I'm sure that we won't sleep for a week if that happens. But we couldn't sleep for a night. But... You know, cricket is just a game, Juan. Football is just a game. All these things are games. Our religion is not a game. So you have to make a distinction. What is a game and what is not a game? And may Allah uh, make us know his names and attributes. And the more we know them, the more we know Allah, the more we are attached to him.